a warm welcome. Good morning to everybody. Um, actually, I don't have an excuse to come to the Nixon Library. One of the, uh, one of the items that actually usually doesn't appear on my resume in any form or shape. After I worked uh, for the Israeli government, I was an advisor in the, in the Robin administration in the mid-90s. Um, um, I went through a period sort of between jobs. You know what happened to Robin in the last. Um, and I got a job writing with Abba Ibn. Abba Ibn was then uh, in retirement, sort of a, a grand man of Israeli diplomacy. And he was writing his, his memoirs. And uh, I agreed to write his memoirs with him. And uh, he decided to write his memoirs based on the great men with whom he had interacted during the course of his long and illustrious career. And the first person we looked at was uh, Richard Nixon. But my job was to go and research Richard Nixon's life, his political career, in particular his diplomacy in the Middle East. Now, having grown up in this country during much of the, the Nixon administration, you know, I had certain preconceived notions, and the further I delved into Nixon's history and legacy, uh, the more I realized that many of these preconceived notions were, in fact, erroneous. And I came through, having written a chapter on Nixon, we were right, reading everything that was published uh, on Nixon and his Middle East diplomacy, and came away um, deeply uh, impressed and moved that here was a man who had profoundly impacted uh, the course of Middle Eastern history, overwhelmingly for the better of the search for peace and the desire to end war, had done immense, made immense contributions certainly to Israel's security. I need no excuse to read. <laughs> Imagine then that you are an American diplomat, high ranking, operating in the Middle East, you've been sent to the Middle East. To, to conduct negotiations with the representative of a Middle Eastern kingdom that has declared war on the United States. And you meet this envoy somewhere in Europe, undisclosed location, and you say to him that the United States bears no animosity whatsoever to this Middle Eastern state. Americans only want to interact peaceably with the peoples of the region. They want to conduct their trade free from foreign threats, and America only wants peace, indeed, with all peoples of the Middle East. And what if this Middle Eastern representative says to you, no, we don't want peace with you, we want war with you. In fact, we have this holy book that tells us that we must conduct war with you, a holy war to enslave you because you are an infidel state and we must rule over all infidel states. And our holy book further tells us that if in the course of pursuing this conflict with you, we are killed, then we will alight immediately to paradise. How would you, as a high-ranking American diplomat, how would you respond to that line of argument? Well, most likely, you would reply that the United States really has no choice but to go to war in the Middle East. And if you would respond that way, you would be echoing the words of Thomas Jefferson. He was the person who conducted these negotiations. Uh, he was meeting in London with a representative of Tripoli, that today in Libya, one of the four so-called Barbary states, including what is today Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. Um, the Morocco, the date was March 1785, and these four Barbary states were conducting a war against the United States, not just any war, but a war of national destruction. The United States had uh, come out of the uh, out of the Revolutionary War, maintained about 20% of its foreign trade through the Mediterranean to the Middle East. America was a seafaring nation, heavily dependent on foreign commerce, very, very fragile economy, and these Barbary states were sending pirates out to prey on American ships, destroying America's economy. And the worst thing is the American had, Americans had absolutely no means of fighting back. The United States did not have a navy, did not have a single gunship in 1785. Moreover, the United States back then, these 13 states, were loosely confederated under the Articles of Confederation. There was no central government, no president, no means of raising taxes to even create a navy. Very, very big problem. America was facing an existential threat from the Middle East. Now, uh, Jefferson believed that the United States should federate. United Jefferson believed that the United States should fight the pirates. He believed that the American people had a certain temper, as he called it, a certain type of personality that did not allow them to bow down to this type of intimidation. But many Americans disagree with him, including uh, John Adams, the second president of the United States, 
uh, who believe that the United States should follow the age-old European practice of buying off the pirates, of paying them what they call tribute, the fancy word for bribery. During Adams' administration, America was paying about one-fifth of its federal revenues in pirate and bribes to Middle Eastern pirates. Americans said, many Americans didn't want a navy, feared that a navy would get them bogged down in European wars, didn't want a federal government, were afraid of tyranny, and mostly they were afraid of getting bogged down in an open-ended and bloody conflict in the distant Middle East. Today, about 220 years later, Americans are facing some of the same challenges from the Middle East, and they are uh, they're being asked to make some of the same fateful uh, decisions, whether to negotiate with their enemies in the region, or whether to palliate them, whether to try to uh, reach some accord with them, or whether to destroy them. Now, few Americans today, however, would be aware that their founding fathers in this nation faced some of the, these very similar situations. Many of them are unaware of their country's century-long legacy in this region, and it is a rich and multifaceted heritage of war and statecraft, of altruism and beneficence, of wild artistic imaginings, and of swashbuckling adventure. Most, I would gather, believe that the United States involvement in the Middle East began sometime after World War II with America's deepening dependent on Middle Eastern oil, the coming of the Cold War to the Middle East, and the advent of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Most Americans, again, I would wager, would be shocked to hear that not only Jefferson and Adams had Middle Eastern policies, but also Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln had Middle Eastern policies. Many would be astonished to know that during the Civil War, 500 Egyptian soldiers served and fought on American soil, or that one of Lincoln's assassins, one of the people who implicated in police in Lincoln's assassination plot, uh, found refuge in and was later arrested in Egypt. Many Americans would be astonished to hear that the original Statue of Liberty showed a veiled Arab woman holding a torch, or that the original words to the Star Spangled Banner spoke of humble Middle Easterners bowing down to the victorious flag of the United States. I too would have been surprised. Once upon a time, I ascribed to all of these assumptions. Uh, it was only some years back, when I was at graduate school, uh, that I heard a lecture off the cuff. I was studying Arab history. And my professor was talking about Egyptian history of the 19th century. And he happened to mention, almost parenthetically, that in the late 1860s, a group of Civil War veterans, Confederate and Union officers, had reunited after the war and had gone off to Egypt to serve, to serve as military advisors modernizing the Egyptian army. And they got to Egypt and they found that most of the Egyptian army, including the officers, was illiterate. And they ended up building schoolhouses to teach literacy to Egyptian soldiers. Egyptian soldiers began to bring their kids. And soon these veterans of Vicksburg and Gettysburg were teaching literacy to Egyptian school children, and while they were at it, they began to choose to teach American ideals of patriotism, civic virtues, and democracy. And I was fascinated by this. I ran off to the library and tried to reach more about it, and I found that there were many general history books about Britain in the Middle East, history books about France in the Middle East, but there was no comprehensive book about America in the Middle East. Certainly no book that would take, take these officers' extraordinary experience in Egypt in the 1860s and put it in some type of historical uh, context. Flash forward about 20 years after I was in graduate school, and I would be able to age me, um, to the aftermath of 9-11, uh, at which point I believe that Americans were being asked to make some very fateful decisions in the Middle East, uh, decisions that would not only impact their own future security, but that of most of the world, and yet they continued to lack a historical context in which these decisions could be made. And so, when my editor and good friend asked me in 2002 what was the one book about the Middle East which had not been written but which absolutely had to be written, I didn't hesitate a nanosecond, and I told him, America in the Middle East. And then the question arose, okay, how do you write such a book? My previous book, as Tim mentioned, was about the Six-Day War, about six days. Now I had to write about 230 years. And to do that, I had to find the underlying themes which bound this rather long legacy 
together, which united the narrative. And the first of the themes that I identified was the most obvious theme, and that is the theme of power. And by power, I mean the pursuit of America's interests in the Middle East by the use of power, whether it be military power, economic power, diplomatic power. Her power certainly describes the situation faced by Thomas Jefferson and other members of the founding generation uh, when they confronted the Barbary pirate threat. Indeed, in the spring of 1787, when uh, delegates from the states convened in Philadelphia to discuss the possibility of making a constitution for this confederated nation, and actually making it a united state, a singular as opposed to a plural noun, at that month, exactly, America was facing its first hostage crisis in the Middle East. There were 127 seamen who had been captured and enslaved by the Barbary pirates. And if you looked at the ratification debate surrounding the Constitution, you will find representatives not only from maritime states like in New England saying, if we don't have a Constitution, we can't have a federal government. If we don't have a federal government, we can't have a Navy. If we don't have a Navy, we will kill our commerce and we will die as a nation. But you also find representatives from southern states who didn't have big maritime interests in the Middle East saying, if we don't have a Constitution, we can't have a federal government. If we don't have a federal government, we have a Navy. If we don't have a Navy, we're going to have Algerines, as they were called that, the Algerians on our shores of North and South Carolina, and they'll be enslaving our sons and daughters. And on the basis of these arguments, Americans chose to unite under this Constitution. And five years later, 1794, Congress passed a bill allocating $688,888.33 to creating America's first six warships. They were created specifically to fight the Middle East, and the Congressional bill created the U.S. Navy, signed into all law by George Washington, says specifically that the U.S. Navy is being constructed to fight in the Middle East. And a long and painful war followed, the Barbary Wars, America's first overseas conflict, America's longest overseas military engagement, uh, the first American servicemen to fight and fall abroad fell and fought in the Middle East. With many setbacks in this war, you should know. It took a long time before 1805, when nine Marines under the command of William Eaton marched 500 miles across the Libyan desert to attack Tripoli from behind. That's the shores of Tripoli in the Marine Hymn. Or 1815, when the Stephen Decatur, for whom about 27 cities and towns in this country are named, led the American fleet into Tripoli and Tunis Harbor and finally subdued uh, the Barbary pirates. America had learned its first lessons in power from and in the Middle East. It was a Middle Eastern threat that had forced this country to coalesce into the United Nations, to construct naval power for the first time, and then for the first time to project that power thousands of miles from America's shore. And by creating a navy not to rule the waves, but to free them, the United States opened the seaways to the Middle East for the agents of American faith. American faith is the second of these great underlying themes which I identify, very, very large theme indeed. And by faith, I mean first and foremost religious faith, and religious faith usually of a Protestant uh, variety. It's that almost irrepressible urge that accompanied this nation's birth to spread America's faith abroad. But it also, that religious faith has a, a secular and civic flip side. This is the, con the notion of an America, which is the city on the hill, a light unto nations, which is coming to being not just to provide liberty for its own population, its own citizens, but to impart that liberty to, the, to all of humanity. And these notions take root in the earliest days of settlement in this, in this, on this continent. Uh, the Puritans come in this early 17th century from England, fleeing persecution. They had likened themselves to the children of Israel escaping from bondage in Egypt. They crossed the Atlantic Ocean, which they likened to the desert, and, they, and entered a new promised land. Uh, they, impeared, they, they proceeded to impose the map of the old promised land, on their country. They gave about a thousand biblical names to their cities and towns. Uh, they made Hebrew a mandatory subject at their universities. Uh, James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton. Uh, they gave biblical names to their sons and daughters. Um, and they felt a 
very close relationship to the old Jews and to the old promised land, then known as Palestine, uh, as part of the Ottoman uh, Empire. And they felt that it was incumbent upon them later as good Christians and good Americans to help uh, God fulfill his biblical prophecies to the Jews, and that was to rescue them from exile and to restore them to their ancient homeland. This was born of the notion of restorationism. So powerful was this notion in the American sort of national thinking that in 1783, at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, there was a contest in Congress over the great seal of the United States. Uh, one school of congressmen came forth and proposed that the seal of the country should be an American bald eagle clutching 13 arrows in its talons, one for each state. You recognize that seal? But there was another contestant in the debate. It showed Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt across the desert following the pillar of smoke. Very, very close contest in Congress. The eagle won out. We came this close to having Moses as a symbol of the United States. The Moses seal was proposed by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And so, with this restorationist idea in mind, Americans proceeded to try to relive it. John Adams, again, the second president of the United States, said that it was his fondest dream that 100,000 Jewish soldiers, as well disciplined as the French army, that was the French army back then, <laughs> would uh, march into Palestine and reclaim it as a Jewish kingdom. And so it's no surprise that a mere three years after the conclusion of the Barbary Wars, 1818, America's first missionaries gentlemen by the name of Pliny Fisk and Levi Parsons leave Boston for the Middle East, and their first task is to run, try to ingather the Jews into Palestine to convert them to con congregationalist Protestantism and have them reenact their ancient state. And failing that, they want to try to convert the Muslim Arabs. But to their chagrin, Pliny Fisk and Levi Parsons, this guy, Soon, the soon discovered that the Jews of the Middle East do not want to ingather under their auspices, do not want to become Congregationalist Protestants. And when they find that they, when they try to convert uh, Muslim Arabs, they are likely to lose their heads for the simple reason that proselytism under Islam is a capital offense. And so they turn to building schools. First, they build elementary schools, secondary schools, Fisk and Parsons build the first modern school system in the Middle East. And their descendants, people who came after them by the 1860s, are building the first modern universities in the Middle East, what will later become the American University of Beirut, the American University of Cairo. And through these universities, these missionaries and their descendants are no longer teaching the gospel of Christianity, but they are teaching what they call a gospel of Americanism, patriotism, civic virtues, and democracy. And they begin to uh, develop and encourage an entirely new identity in the Middle East, and that's the identity of Arab nationalism. It's a secular identity in which all Arabic-speaking peoples, whether they be Muslims, Christians, Druze, or even Jews, can participate. And again, the descendants of these missionaries become very closely identified with the Arab nationalist idea. Many of them speak, their children speak Arabic, they speak Parsi, they go into the State Department and become the Arabists of the State Department. Many of them go into the oil companies, which as executives, which starting in the late 1830s, early 1940s, begin to exert an increasing influence on America's policies toward the Middle East. And to the degree that after World War I, Arab nationalism clashes with this idea of recreating a Jewish state, which is then known as Zionism, these descendants of the missionaries come to very much oppose the, uh, the ideas of uh, restorationism that many of their forebears had, had, which had brought many of their forebears to the Middle East. Very interesting. That does not mean that restorationism did not remain a very prominent movement indeed in the United States, certainly during the antebellum period, um, perhaps the greatest single expression of the restorationist idea appears in a book published in 1844. It was called Valley of the Visions. And in this book, Valley of the Visions, there is a call on the US government to spearhead an international effort to recreate the Jewish state in Palestine. The author even calls on the US Navy to help provision this nascent Jewish state until it can get up on its own two legs. This book, Valley of the Visions, becomes an antebellum bestseller. It sold about a million copies. 
before the outbreak of the Civil War, and it was authored by the chairman of the Hebrew and Scripture Department of New York University, a gentleman by the name of George Bush. <laughs> and uh, two, to two days of work in the uh, genealogy department of the Library of Congress enabled me to ascertain that this George Bush was in fact a direct forebear of two American presidents by the same name. For some Americans though, merely envisioning this renewed Jewish state was insufficient. Starting in the 1830s, groups of Americans uh, began to leave this country and to travel to Palestine to set up colonies. Um, many American women, incidentally, uh, Harriet Livermore from Chicago, Clorinda Minor from Philadelphia, went to Palestine to build farms in which they hoped to teach the Jews how to farm. Um, these were all good Jeffersonians, and Jefferson believed that the, the only truly viable base of a modern state is, was an agrarian economy. Since so the Jews had been in exile for 2,000 years, these Americans thought they, it was incumbent upon them to teach them how to farm, reintroduce themselves to agriculture. Um, and Clorinda Minor, Harriet Livermore, and others came to Palestine at the time to do this. 1855, the Dixon family from Groton, Massachusetts, Philip Dixon, his wife, and two daughters uh, moved to Palestine. The two daughters married two German Lutheran preachers, also brothers who were working there. Their names were Frederick and Johann Rosteinbeck. And they set up a colony called, uh, called Mount Hope outside of Jaffa, near the coast. And like many of the colonies that had preceded them, they suffered terribly from, uh, from disease, from hunger, from attack by Bedouin bandits. Many of the Jews of Palestine did not want to learn how to farm uh, from, these, uh, from these rather <coughs> idyllic Yankees. And yet still they came. Uh, Ten years later, 1866, uh, George Adams, a gentleman from Indian River, Maine, left Indian River with about 156 of his followers, artisans, merchants, farmers. They came and tried to set up a colony, also near Jaffa. And again, they suffered just terribly from hunger, uh, exposure, and from attack. But the, 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 the idea of restoration remained very, very strong at home. Uh, 1863, Abraham Lincoln is asked what he thinks of the idea of restoring the Jews to their homeland. He says that that is a dream which is dear to a great many Americans. And Lincoln expressed the hope that the United States, once it restored its own unity after the Civil War, would be able to work to realize that dream. Now, it's extraordinary, the, the, uh, the debate, uh, within, even within American Christians, over Restorationism, what is today called Zionism, continues. If you want to look into Jimmy Carter's book, you'll see an example of just how deep and, 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 and accurate that debate, that debate remains. But one thing to keep in mind is that whether you are a detractor or supporter of this restoration notion, um, that both of these schools of thought emanate from the faith-guided approach of America to the Middle East. It is part of this faith component in America's Middle East engagement. And finally, we come to the most elusive and mystical of these themes, and that is the theme of fantasy. That is the fantasy image of the Middle East as a realm of unbridled romanticism, exoticism, even eroticism. This is the notion, this image of, of, of black-clad nomads sweeping out of the desert, out of the oasis, and sweeping up some innocent damsel, usually from the West, and taking her off to his tent. The notion of a liberty-loving nomad, we find it in the first writings of America's uh, first explorers in the Middle East, John Ledyard, 1788, a good friend of Thomas Jefferson in his correspondence with Jefferson from Egypt. Ledyard talks about the liberty-loving nomad. This is the notion that the Arabs in the desert are basically like the American frontiersmen. They love to be unfettered. They don't like government. And the, the, the fact that the Middle East is now, these people, these liberty-loving people are now uh, suppressed, oppressed by uh, tyrannies of the Middle East. If America will only come and remove these tyrannies, then the liberty-loving people of the Middle East will rise up and embrace that form of democracy. Sound familiar? That is how old this notion is, from 1788. Now, the roots of these fantasies run very deep in the American consciousness. They go back, many of them, to the second most popular book on the colonial bookshelf. That is after the Bible, of course. And that book was A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, a collection of medieval Persian tales, Ali Baba, Sinbad the Sailor, Scheherazade, storytelling for, his, for her life. Um, and people read these books, and they saw these images of the flying carpets, and they saw these veiled but available harem girls, 
and they believe that this is what the Middle East really looked like. And they, some of them were lured to go and see this magical, mystical Middle East for themselves. And so thousands of Americans, starting the late 18th century through the course of the 19th century, start traveling to the Middle East not as missionaries, but as tourists, adventure seekers. By the 1850s, Americans have surpassed the English as the single largest national group traveling to the Middle East for tourism. You have all these memoirs of English travelers complaining how the Americans have snatched up all the good hotel rooms in Damascus. One of those who came to the Middle East in search of this romance was a, an American author whose previous book, Moby Dick, had sold a mere 3,000 copies. Uh, he was very depressed about that. He was looking for a new source of scintillating inspiration about which he could write another novel. In 1855, Herman Melville packed two shirts and a toothbrush and went off to the Middle East. And he kept this vivid diary of his travels there. I recommend it to you. With his, the writing very postmodern and rather hallucinogenic. Um, <laughs> extraordinary. And, um, and he wrote just, just Sternly of his disappointment about the Middle East. He found that the Middle East didn't resemble anything uh, of what he had read about in the Thousand Old Nights. Another note of dis dis disappointment was struck by yet another aspiring uh, American writer who came about 12 years later, 1867, a young writer out of Missouri who had replanted himself in California, named Samuel Clemens, uh, boarded the Quaker City steamship out of Philadelphia and came to the Middle East. He got a contract with two American papers to publish his collected dispatches from the region. He published them under the omnibus title Innocence Abroad, uh, and which he published under his new pen name, Mark Twain. Innocence Abroad became the largest selling American book of the second half of the 19th century. Uh, sold more copies between like to quip than the Bible. Uh, and it was about his trip to the Middle East, Twain's trip to the Middle East. Um, now, Twain, Melville, they all learned that these Middle Eastern uh, myths clashed rather harshly with Middle Eastern realities. And yet these myths persist. They persisted through the 19th century into the 20th century when they are appropriated by Hollywood. In fact, one of Hollywood's <coughs> first blockbuster films is a Middle Eastern romance, The Sheikh of Araby from 1921, that held Rudolph Valentino to stardom. And then, of course, this popular song by the same name with those engaging lyrics, I'm the Sheikh of Araby, my heart belongs to thee. At night when you're asleep, <laughs> to your tent, I creep. <laughs> Most of us with a certain generation can We'll remember, uh, Tim, you're about my age, remember the 1974 Maria Moldauer hit of the year, Midnight at the Oasis? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same lyrics, only it's the woman saying she's got to creep into the tent. <laughs> there followed an almost unbroken series of Middle Eastern fantasy movies, all the way up to the Indiana Joneses and the Saharas and the Hidalgos, those of you who unfortunately have not seen that movie. Um, and Mystified by these myths, many Americans might have wondered in September of 2001 why picturesque men in flowing robes would leave their camels, leave their oases, and come to the United States to hijack American airliners and fly them into major skyscrapers. Power, faith, <coughs> and fantasy. Now, sometimes these themes exist independently in America's Middle Eastern experience. More often than not, though, they exist in some kinds of tension, if not open competition, with one another. They run through the narrative sort of, sort of thread-like, intertwined, uh, binding this extraordinary story. For example, fantasy met up with faith in 1855, when Melville, during his visit to the Middle East, happened to visit the Philip Dixon colony outside of Jaffa. And uh, about a month, he writes, rather critically of what the Dixons are doing. He has lunch with Dixons, his daughters, with Philip and Johann Rosteinbeck, the Lutheran brothers. Uh, and then he leaves. A month later, in January 1856, the Dixon colony is attacked by Bedouin bandits. Uh, Philip Dixon is knocked mortally on the head. His wife and two daughters are brutally and repeatedly raped. A terrible deposition given to the American consulate about this attack. Frederick Rosteinbeck is shot in the groin and dies in agonizing and slow death. And the only survivor, really, of the Dixon colony is Johann Grossteinbeck, whom, according to Congressional to Consular Records, at that point leaves Palestine, moves to California, and uh, anglicizes his name. 
Now, Melville would actually allude to this attack in his 18,000 line poem, uh, Clarel, it's about this big. Um, and he talks about the rape scene of this character uh, of the Dixon colony, but there would be other allusions to this rape and attack in uh, books written by Johann Grosch Steinbeck's grandson in his biblical and tragic epics, Rapes of Wrath and East of Eden. Uh, it's true that John Steinbeck's grandfather had lunch with Herman Melville in Palestine in 1855 on a colony dedicated to teaching the Jews how to farm. Um, Mark Twain when he leaves Palestine in 1867 on the Quaker City. The Quaker City evacuates the 47 remaining members of the George Adams colony, the survivors, those who had not succumbed to disease and starvation. He writes stirringly of their plight as well in the last chapter of Innocence Abroad. <coughs> Power mixed with faith. In 1903, when Teddy Roosevelt sent battleships into Beirut Harbor, to threaten the Ottomans' authorities, whom Roosevelt accused of having mistreated American missionaries operating in the, city, in the city. And faith grappled with power again in 1917, when Woodrow Wilson uh, joined World War I, declared war against the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, but then had to decide whether to declare war against the third central power, which was the Ottoman Empire. A strong bipartisan support in both houses of Congress called on the president to wage war immediately against the Ottomans. Teddy Roosevelt, and by then a very popular ex-president, said if the United States didn't go to war against the Ottomans, it had lost all claim to this, this charge that was making the world safe for democracy. But Wilson, the grandson, the son, and nephew of Presbyterian ministers was exceptionally close to the missionaries. And the missionaries came to him and said, Mr. President, you go to war against the Ottomans, and the Turks will do to us what they're doing to the Armenians. Of course, they were massacring the Armenians. At the end of the war, Wilson decided not to wage war in the Middle East. And as a result, at the end of that war, there were about a million uh, British soldiers in the region, about several hundred thousand French soldiers in the region, not one American serviceman serving in the Middle East at the end of World War I. Guess which countries got to draw the post-war map of the Middle East, not the United States. And finally, faith trumped power in 1948. Uh, in 1948, uh, after the UN had decided to partition Palestine into an independent Arab and Jewish state, the Jewish state was about to be declared on May 14, 1948, in an, in, a, in an event that was truly unusual, and really the entire annual, annals of American foreign policy, the entire American foreign policy establishment, the State Department, the Defense Department, the Pentagon, came to the president and said, Mr. President, if you recognize this Jewish state, all of the Arab oil makers will go over to the Soviets, there'll be an oil cut off to the West, Western Europe will dry up and fall to the communists, and what's worse, uh, the United States Army will have to intervene in Palestine to save the 600,000 Jews there from almost certain massacre at the hands of Arab armies. Uh, the president that he went to was Harry Truman, Harry Truman, a strict Baptist who had read his Bible many times, claims to have known it by heart by age 14. And Truman had to make this decision. Uh, his own Secretary of State, George Marshall, probably the most revered American of his generation, said, Mr. President, you recognize this Jewish state. I, George Marshall, will not vote for you in the 1948 elections. Uh, Truman listened to all these arguments. He locked himself into the White House on May 13th and emerged 24 hours later at 6.11 p.m. 1948, 11 minutes after Israel had declared its independence and made the United States the first uh, country on earth to uh, recognize the newly created Jewish state. Why did he do this? Why did he risk global catastrophe? We don't know. All we know is that several weeks later, there was a delegation of visitors to the White House, and they ran into Truman in the hall, and he was introduced as Harry Truman, the president who had helped create, helped create the State of Israel, and he got angry. Truman said, what do you mean help create? What do you mean help create? He said, I'm Cyrus. He said, I'm Cyrus. Cyrus, of course, being the Persian king who restored the Jews to exile and helped them recreate the Jewish state. Now, since 1948, since the United States replaced Britain and France as the ascendant power in the Middle East, since the United States became heavily dependent on Middle Eastern sources of oil, Americans have struggled mightily to reconcile these competing impulses of power, faith, and fantasy. 
The result has been an almost breathtaking, staggering zigzag in America's foreign policy toward the region. For example, in 1953, the United States banded with Great Britain in overthrowing a popular nationalist Iranian prime minister named Mohammad Mossadegh, whom the British and the Americans feared had become too close to the Soviets. But exactly three years later, the United States turned on Great Britain, as well as on France, in the Suez Crisis to save another popular Middle Eastern nationalist leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, the president of Egypt, uh, acting, the United States acting out of a purely faith-guided, anti-colonialist approach to the Middle East. American forces have fought against Libya, against Syria, and Iran in the post-war period, and yet people here forget, certainly people in the Middle East forget, that America, America played a pivotal role in assuring the independence of all three of those countries. United States presidents have consistently supported the state of Israel, but at crucial junctures, uh, American presidents have levied arms embargo on Israel and pressured Israeli leaders to relinquish territories which they thought were vital to their uh, security. President Nixon, for example, uh, exerted immense pressures on Israeli leaders to uh, relinquish territories for peace under the Rogers Initiative, under later Kissinger uh, programs in the Middle East, and yet, during the 1973 uh, Middle Eastern War, the Yom Kippur War, uh, Nixon uh, was willing to go to the brink of a nuclear confrontation uh, with the Soviet Union over the security of Israel and the Middle East. Ronald Reagan beefed up Saddam Hussein as a foil to the Iranians in the 1980s. Then he turned around and sold arms to the Iranians in an effort to induce them to take fewer American hostages in Lebanon, basically violating the first lesson of America's Barbary Wars, the more you try to pay off pirates, the more piracy you'll get. <laughs> Americans strove to create a Pax Americana in the Middle East, and yet American forces have been engaged almost uninterruptedly in the region since 1979, almost a 30 years war in the Middle East, during which time we have witnessed how the uniforms of American servicewomen and men have burnished from a light Vietnamese green in the 1970s to a tawny Arabian brown today. In 2003, America invaded Iraq. And for one gleaming minute, the bearers of American power, US Army and Marines, were patrolling the fabled capital of 100,001 Arabian Nights, the capital of Baghdad. And they were imparting democracy to a people who appeared willing, indeed desperate, to embrace them. That moment, however, has proven to be fleeting. Today, Americans must once again strive to balance their vital interests in the Middle East with the precepts of their American ideals, all the while distinguishing, distinguishing, distinguishing between the real and the mythic Middle East. That task is gargantuan. My book, I hate to just point you on this, does not prescribe a path for achieving this. Really disappointing. As an historian, I always say I have enough trouble predicting the past. <laughs> and yet, I, I do want to share my fascination with you, my fascination with this just extraordinary legacy, to tell you uh, why the original Lady Liberty was an Arab woman with a veil holding a torch, why the original lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner spoke of humble Middle Easterners bowing down to the American flag, um, I was just singing that before a ball game. Um, <laughs> to read about these in greater depth, alas, you're just going to have to read the book. Um, more crucially, though, I, I want to instill in all of you and in all of my readers an, an appreciation of America's remarkable history in the Middle East. It's a legacy of militancy at times, of greed at others, but also one of generosity, of tolerance, and of courage. My aim is to provide a context of the past in which Americans, now profoundly, and some would even say existentially involved in the Middle East, can begin to chart their future. Thank you. Consequences for our actions. 
How will we not, in the end, become as bad as the Muslims that the uh, church views, and in the end, destroy the world? I'm not an expert on evangelical Christianity, and uh, I'm certainly not an expert on evangelical theology. And as an historian uh, who has yet to see the documents, I'm going to be the last person who's going to say who started the, the Iraq war, but the evangelical Christians are oil interests, depends who you go to. Uh, there's a whole list of people who are accused of having started the Iraq war. Um, and I know that among uh, evangelical Christians, the, the apocryphal end of days evangelical Christians are, are actually a small minority. Those who would be similar, say, to what the, the uh, apocalyptic uh, Mahdist regime in Iran you know, wants to precipitate some type of uh, global catastrophe that will bring about the end of days. I understand that evangelical Christians have that as a, that is a small minority. So I, I really wouldn't begin to know how to answer your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I Can everyone hear that question? Yeah. I'll, I'll repeat it. We have a microphone. No, I'm going to repeat it. Do you want to repeat it? I'll do it. For, for everybody's sake. Uh, I, I, I have an uh, author for a recent I write for the, the Republic. I'm a social editor. Um, and a recent article that appeared last week, written by myself and my, my colleague, Jesse Kyle-Levy, talked about uh, the Iran uh, threat as seen from an Israeli perspective. And this was a, a strange. An unusual activity for me because I don't often act as a reporter, but this was pure reportage. Uh, I didn't express any personal opinion in this article. Um, I was simply interviewing a great number of people involved in Israeli intelligence and the Mossad and in decision making, Israeli uh, uh, politicians. And uh, what they concluded the overwhelming consensus in Israel is that Iran poses an existential threat, not to belabor that term, it poses a, an actual uh, a, an existential threat to the state of Israel, not only because you have this. Um, uh, apocalyptic Mahdist regime there that is willing, Israeli intelligence officials believe, to give up one half of their population to destroy Israel. They say they're going to destroy Israel every day, uh, denying the Holocaust. They don't even report it all when they say it here anymore. Uh, but because once Iran begets the bomb, Israel will be incapable of responding to terror in any way. If we, Hezbollah shoots a rocket, we shoot a rocket back. Iran will go on nuclear alert. We'll have to go on nuclear alert. The tourism will stop coming. The foreign investment will stop coming. Israel will die economically. Moreover, every region, every every state and region will end up nuclear, and we'll be, we'll be living in a nuclear neighborhood which will be literally uninhabitable. Um, so it's an existential threat. The question is how do you address an existential threat? Uh, there is not a great amount of confidence about the about the sanction regime. Um, there is not a great amount of confidence about George Bush's ability or willingness to, to act, especially now after the change of uh, hands in Congress. And I've talked to people in Washington several times, and they all say, and the Democrats say that if George Bush were to act. Uh, against Iran now, precipitously, they moved to impeach him. Um, and this leaves uh, Israelis facing this existential threat. Um, not only Israelis, but people throughout the region who fear Iran, but we have probably better ability to deal with it. And the big break, the big split in Israel is between those who believe that the Iranian counterstrike uh, will be survivable and those who think that it will actually leave Israel devastated. And among those people who believe this will be devastated, one of the reasons it will be devastated is that the Syrians will join. The Syrians have thousands of SS-21 missiles that are, are chemically tipped. And those are the Israelis who are now seeking to reach an accord secretly uh, with, the, with the Syrians, with the notion that giving back the Golan Heights, occupied by, by Israel in 1967, is not a prohibitive price to pay to knock Syria out of Iran's orbit. Now, if you saw my New York Times op-ed, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, the op-ed generated some controversy from interesting quarters. I know that this, this would be the first time, Israel has many times negotiated with, with Arabs secretly without involving the United States and bringing the United States in at the last minute. Uh, but this may be the first time Israel has negotiated with, uh, with an Arab state uh, without the United States knowledge, and the United States has opposed, the Bush administration is not happy about these negotiations. They view uh, Syria as an honorary member of the Axis of Evil. Uh, the Syria is involved in promoting the insurgency. Syria is involved in undermining the democratically elected government of Lebanon. And they're not interested in having Syria let off the hook so easily. So going back to your question, do I think, what do I think? I think it's important to keep channels of communication open with Iran. It's one of the few parts of the baker Hamilton report I agree with. Um, but. Um, <coughs> I, I, I honestly, at the end of the day, am not very sanguine about the chances of diplomacy. I think it's important to exhaust all venues of diplomacy. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you're dealing with an extremely aggressive regime uh, in Iran uh, that is a theological regime. It's not occupied. We cannot, at the end of the day, rely on the fact that these people are going to act rationally because they have not always acted rationally in the past. Now, keep in mind, Israel, Israel from one point, is it's a one bomb country. Second strike doesn't mean anything. I'm sorry, it was a long answer, but it was a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a housekeeping question. I know that you're being taken. Mm -hmm. This is not heavy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Well, it's heavy. I noticed you're being taped. Maybe you purchased the tape. I, I, don't, I didn't know I was being taped. You can certainly purchase the tape. And, and it's a book on audiobooks. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. My so last book is on audiobooks. It's a war. I asked them if I could do the audio. They said, no, you have an American accent. They wanted someone with a British accent. <laughs> really annoying thing is that they're right. This guy's got those beautiful accents. So, so I, I listened to as a toy. I wrote that. Um, so I don't know if we're going to have a British person giving America the Middle East. If they ask me, I'd like to do it. Sure. Sure. I wonder if during the obviously exhaustive research that you have undertaken here, you encountered uh, the fact that in the fall of uh, 1956, uh, President Eisenhower was ready to uh, stage a combat landing in the upper reaches of the, the Persian Gulf at the time the Suez Canal was closed. And if you did encounter that, I wonder if you could uh, address the, the issue at all to help me understand it better. Have you seen these documents? Sir? Have you seen these documents? Uh, no, I was at the time a uh, lieutenant of Marines and was on uh, was part of a reinforced battalion landing team that was. Uh, Turned back to the mouth of the Persian Gulf uh, near Karachi uh, on our way up to either Dharan or Bahrain, where we were to make a combat landing in the Arab uh, subcontinent. I've been to the Eisenhower uh, archives twice, as our presidential library in Abilene, Kansas. It's a great experience for anybody to do it. There's no, no transportation to that place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to Abilene. It's a beautiful marble, marble and structure. Uh, great library, wonderful archive, and I've looked at all of the documents that have been declassified about the Suez Crisis. I have never encountered that, and I'd be very interested in hearing about it. Give me your card later. Um, <laughs> never heard about that. classification of the Freedom of Information Act, and it's a, it's a revolving thing. Some of them take years. I am still getting documents five, six later, years later to classify under the Freedom of Information Act. Sometimes it just takes a while, but I have never, I have never heard any information from <coughs> such an operation. It's interesting because usually in such an operation, you'll see shadows of that operation in other documents, and you'll say, oh, what's this about? You, you get a sense. It's almost like the way an astronomer looks at a, at a black hole in the universe. You see, ah, there's something exerting gravity there. There must be a body out there. You see conversations and protocols that they're talking about something. It means that there's something out there, even though you don't have the actual document in front of you. And I never even, I've never encountered an, intim an intimation of such an operation. That's very interesting. Yes? Um, most of the things you talked about, I mean, you talked about individuals, the authors, and things like that. But what happened on 9-11 were not necessarily huge governments going and doing this. It was individuals within a movement within or without the support of an actual government to do it. So how do you foresee the, the, the change in how the, that has um, made our diplomacy um, from governments dealing with governments to dealing with individual terror cells or individual <coughs> No, that is basically the question facing the American view. You just hit on it. All of our models, and by the way, including our models from Cold War, um, um, the, the Cold War sort of stand, nuclear stand, <coughs> based on mutually assured destruction. The notion that you take, you know, New York will take Moscow. Um, that doesn't hold the Middle East because, for what we know, people in Tehran, uh, mutually assured destruction um, may not be a, a deterrence; may be an inducement. Um, <coughs> People are desperate for paradise. Um, uh, our notion of state-backed terror, and here's a, here's, a, here's a model that goes back to Jefferson. 
um, may not hold either. We have international, rather amorphous, uh, clandestine organizations that are maybe receiving uh, support from some aspect of governments, maybe some aspect of the Saudi government, maybe some parts of the Pakistani government, or some individuals in those countries are not state, are not state backed. And so one of the things we're going to have to do is we confront a continuing threat in the Middle East, and the Middle East will be a threat. It's not like Vietnam when you pull out, and you, know, you pull, push the helicopters off the side of the uh, aircraft carrier and go home. You can't do that here because the Middle East is going to come after you in various ways. What you're going to have to attach is you're going to have to develop an entirely different model for conflict confrontation and resolution in the Middle East. And I, I have ideas. I'm not without ideas. I'm not a historian. And uh, among the many ideas, of course, is training an entire generation of American servicemen and men to speak the languages of these regions, because you're operating with an army that don't speak the languages of the region, don't know the region. Maintaining a rapid deployment forces in the region for, you know, they can react within six hours and not six months. But I think most importantly, embrace yourself with this, America has to get involved in the nitty gritty of theology. Something that's very difficult for a country that has separation of church and state, but we are meeting a theology with an ideology and it's not working. And um, I'll just give you one example of something I just learned about last week. It's this recent. Um, Germany. Germany has separation of church and state, but German school children are allowed one hour of religious instruction every day in the national school system. And there are a great number of Muslim children now in Germany, and Germany won't get into the business of making Islamic textbooks, so they import the textbooks from Wahhabi schools in Saudi Arabia. So now you have millions of uh, Muslims who are learning this very extreme, very violent uh, version of Islam. No one is countering, no one is developing, or even offering them a, 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 another interpretation, and e a, a certainly at least as equally legitimate interpretation of Islam, uh, in terms of uh, the tradition of coexistence and peace. And uh, if America doesn't get into the business of promoting that, we will forfeit the field these radical ideas. And so there are many different ways, but the old models, you actually are not, are no, many of them are no longer valid. Everyone's on the right here. What's this mean? All right, yes. Uh, would you say that, uh, that um, was, uh, was Iraq sort of on the back burner for American foreign policy before 1958. Um, I noticed, for example, that when Vice President Nixon visited the Middle East in 53, I believe it was, that he, he went to most of the countries in the region, but he didn't go to Iraq. Iraq before 1958 was reviewed as a preserve of the British. The British didn't want Americans running around there too much. Uh, after 1958 and the revolution, uh, Iraq became the preserve of the various rings of the Baptist Party and of the kid closely aligned with the Soviet Union, so American officials weren't welcome there. It's not until the 1980s when Donald Rumsfeld makes two trips uh, to visit Saddam Hussein because they, they were interested in Saddam Hussein uh, acting as a foil to the Iranians uh, that the American-Iraqi uh, alliance, although it's an implicit alliance, uh, begins to form. It's interesting that one of the pivotal events in the creation of this uh, implicit alliance uh, was the Israeli bombing of the Syrac, uh, Iraqi nuclear reactor in October of 1981. Um, as you know, uh, the Reagan administration, something that we call the Reagan administration, initially condemned the attack and actually sponsored a UN security resolution that denounced that the Israelis were doing it. And as part of this resolution, Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, who recently passed away, um, was uh, forced to meet with the Iraqi ambassador and work out a, a common language. And it started to open a channel of communication between Baghdad and Washington uh, that remained uh, quite open until the summer of 1991, when April Gillespie, the American ambassador uh, to Iraq, informed uh, Saddam saying that the United States had had no uh, position on the uh, Iraqi Kuwait issue. That it was an internal Arab issue the United States would set aside. Um, as you know, Saddam Hussein interpreted that rather incorrectly. <laughs> Let me get this gentleman way back. Uh, what do you think the impact of the uh, Iranian Revolution had on the Middle East? Huge. Iran, since 1979, has replaced Egypt as the predominant Muslim power in the Middle East. Is a again an extremely aggressive regime that is aggressing in, into uh, Lebanon, into eastern Saudi Arabia, through Iraq. If you read the front cover of the New York Times today, talking about American government, Americans not talking about open Iranian support 
uh, for the surgency, tremendous amount of weaponry and training going there. Uh, from an Israeli perspective, it's not only the nuclear threat, it's the, it's the uh, support to Hamas and uh, to Hezbollah. The Iranians probably precipitated last year's war, last summer's war, uh, in an effort to divert public and international attention from its nuclear program. It's going to touch up a regional war just to get people get, get this nuclear program off the, off the docket a bit. Uh, a very um, a very aggressive regime. It doesn't mean the United States shouldn't keep channels of communications open to it. It should. But at the same time, it also has to, it has to remain extremely vigilant about uh, what the Iranians are up to. What they appear to be all up to is creating an unbroken arc of Iranian uh, privacy extending from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. And they, they have been very, very successful at doing it. They really have been. Um, really, Lebanon's in terrible shape. And, um, that Iran is, Iran is going to remain a major threat. I, many people talk about the possibility of regime change in, in Iran, and I'm, I'm not very sanguine about it. I mean, this regime is, is screwed in rather tight there. Sure. There have been a number, historically, a number of Mahdi uprisings throughout the Middle East, mm -hmm. which are and and to Shia, uh, yeah. Shia perceptions of what uh, Islamic theology is about. Is there any danger that we're looking at something like that now? I mean, Manjad's posturing as, as if he could be the hidden imam. Um, <coughs> or he has had, he's, he's claimed to have a consult, he's had to have consulted with the hidden imam. A lot of it depends on, um, everyone who tells you they know what's going on in Iran are lying. Nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> I talk to the Iranian experts all over the place, and they say diametrically false things. Nobody really knows what's going on in Iran. Manjad's in control, he's not in control. One thing I think appears to be true is that there is now a, a, a struggle for secession uh, for the spiritual leader of Iran. It's a very powerful position. And if uh, Ahmadinejad's spiritual mentor, uh, Mohammed Yazdi, uh, achieves uh, power there, then this notion of a, um, an, a, uh, an apocalyptic Mahdist regime, one that will seek some type of major international or regional encounter clash in order to precipitate the return of the hidden ma the Mahdi, or the hidden Imam, uh, will be very much greater. And don't, do not, the terrible tendency in this country, and this is true of the Middle East, America's attitude to the Middle East in general, today and 230 years ago, was not to take Islam seriously as a power, and, and as a force. And um, I think, it, I was thinking back just your last year I was teaching in this country, during the uh, elections for the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas won, and everyone seems to be surprised. If you read the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, the reason they always gave why Hamas won was because Al Fatah was corrupt, or the Israelis were occupying, or no one's collecting garbage. And of all the reasons they gave, the one reason nobody gave was that people in the Middle East are drawn to Islam because it's a powerful message, a powerful and positive message. Not the assumption in America, the assumption in America, media, that the only reason someone would vote for an Islamic party is if they're driven to it, you know, if they're desperate. It's a positive message. And um, this is certainly true in Iran as well. Don't underestimate ever, ever the power and, and the attraction of the Lord of Islam. Dynamic religion. Sure. The situation you described about the arc of Iranian influence throughout the Middle East, how would that situation exist? Would it be this would be much sooner had the U.S. not restored the Shah back to power in the 50s. Oh, it's not clear what is, what is. We don't know. You know, there are, you, as much as America's influence in the Middle East has had uh, a far-reaching impact on the region, there are many, many things in the Middle East, and I would venture to say most of them is that occur because of internal Middle Eastern dynamics. Guess what? It's not all because of us. <laughs> I hate that, that's kind of hard to let go of that. <laughs> Not all of us are actually, there is, and if someone were to assert that everything that happens in this country is because of what happens in Iran, you think they were crazy. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there are also internal dynamics, social issues in Iran. Um, I had a wonderful research paper at the LS, some of our undergraduates in Iran, who talked about this dynamic, about what had occurred economically, financially, and socially to bring about the coming of Romania in 1979. It was fascinating. Uh, but not all about it. Uh, was the removal of Mossadegh a bad idea? Yes, it was a bad idea, in retrospect. But even then, I'm talking about, I'm talking about documents. I had another graduate student, and uh, he was, he was uh, doing research in recently classified CIA documents, and he claimed to me that Mossadegh was a Soviet agent, according to the CIA. So uh, we don't know everything entirely. I don't think it was a 
Well, you have it on the latest uh, Hamas and Fatah agreement was, that was uh, ratified in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think it's going to affect the region? No, it, I don't think very much. I just, I, it was a great victory for Hamas. Um, Mohammed was there, uh, Mahmoud Abbas gave up a tremendous amount in terms of his legitimacy and his latitude to strike this agreement. The agreement has less to do, uh, say, with the peace process than it does with the possibility of ending the fighting between the factions and to somehow getting uh, an element of international aid restored. At this point, it does not seem that large amounts of international aid are going to be restored because the, uh, the, this unity government did not meet the three benchmarks of ending terror, recognizing previous PLO uh, Israel agreements, and accept the existence of the State of Israel. In fact, the head of Hamas has come out and said that they'll never accept the State of Israel. I don't know how they're going to renew. Uh, which means that there's not going to be money. That the PA needs $160 million a month to survive. And if that money is not forthcoming, these people between Hamas and Islamic, uh, Hamas and, and Fatah are going to be fighting each other again. It's going to break down. So, uh, and by the way, this is not this was interest. It's not anybody's interest to have this thing break down. It would be much in our interest to have uh, a viable uh, unity government that did meet the benchmark, and it doesn't. So I say this with no great, uh, no sense of crisis of joy, I'll be sad. No one wants to ask about the history of America. Don't anybody want to hear about Abe Lincoln's policies? <laughs> <laughs> Why the Statue of Liberty? Or the, the <laughs> <laughs> Everyone yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the wonderful thing about being a story. You get to ask all these questions. Mm -hmm. The uh, man who fled to Egypt after the assassination of Lincoln, can you give me the story on that? Surat. It was the dog, he was the son of uh, Mary Surratt, the innkeeper in Washington, where all the, uh, the, where all the, the Wilkes Booth and uh, uh, conspirators met. And he was charged uh, with the implication of the plot. Uh, he escaped an extraordinary story. So now you find out if you're interested, I think you're aspiring to try and write the story because he escapes here, escapes to Switzerland, becomes a Swiss guard guarding the Pope. <laughs> okay. He's wearing, he's wearing the doublet and hose and cowling and cowling and Albert. And when he finds that the heat is coming to Rome, uh, escapes. And um, the United States uh, received information uh, that, uh, that, that Surat had escaped Switzerland and might be on route to Egypt. They alerted Charles Hale, the American Consul General in Alexandria, who went down to the dock and waited every day to watch the packet arriving from Europe, the Daily Packet, and uh, noticed, was looking for someone who looked American. <laughs> and lo and behold, Surat looked American. And he was arrested, and the Egyptians um, uh, put, put him in chains and sent him back. And it's an interesting thing, his trial resulted in a hung jury, and he was the only Lincoln conspirator who was acquitted, and he died a free man in 1916. Uh, to show its appreciation uh, for Egypt's cooperation in the, in the hunt for Surat, um, the, uh, the Johnson administration uh, sent a portrait of, uh, of Lincoln, of the late president, uh, as a gift to the Khadim of, the, of Egypt. It's my um, interesting story. One of many things. Also, Lincoln's, um, my, was my favorite chapter in this book is the chapter of the Civil War in the Middle East. And I think those of you who are Civil War uh, Buffs will be fascinated to see just how much the Civil War was integrated in the Middle East and how the American Civil War changed the history of the Middle East, just utterly changed the history of the Middle East. In many ways, we're still dealing with the reverberations of the Civil War, um, that Civil War unleashed in the Middle East. Lincoln's last words, last known words on the way to Ford's Theater, April 1865, uh, he turned to his wife, Mary, and said, I'd like to visit Jerusalem. He said it twice. He wanted to be one of those thousands of tourists going to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Did you read about that? Please tell about the statue of the <laughs> 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 so you don't have to buy the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last, last story. It's up to you. How are we doing? Okay, how are we doing for We need to figure out. Okay, last story. I'll, I'll leave you with this. You've got to promise to read the book anyway. Okay? <laughs> This is one of the reasons in this book every day was, oh my god, oh my god, I don't believe it. This is a really, oh, uh, I can't believe it. Um, Civil War. North blockade the South. Cotton. All of European cotton mills depend on southern, uh, all of Europe's cotton mills depend on southern cotton for, to make their textiles. All of a sudden, no cotton. There's only one place in the world that has cotton of a quality which compete with southern cotton is Egyptian cotton. The whole story how that cotton got there. 
If the price of Egyptian cotton goes up 800%, Egypt becomes very, very wealthy as a result of the Civil War. And with this money, the Egyptian government builds huge palaces, it builds boulevards, it builds the opera house in which Verdi's Aida is performed for the same time, that first time. And they build the Suez Canal with this money. And uh, they wanted an interesting statue to grace the entrance of the Suez Canal, so they turned to a young French sculptor who had been living in Egypt, a gentleman by the name of Frederick Boholdi, who designed a statue. We have his terracotta cotta makeups, we have his oil and ink uh, uh, drawings of it, one of them is reproduced in the book, uh, showing an Arab woman holding a veil, holding a torch, a light that's going to serve as double as a lighthouse. Uh, they called Egypt lighting the gateway to Asia. And the Egyptian government bought it. And um, they, in 1869, the Civil War was over, the Southern cotton came back, and the Egyptian cotton market plummeted, crashed. Egypt went into bankruptcy. Someone sold them in 1882. The, the British invaded Egypt to collect on its debts. So there's a direct connection between the Civil War and the 1956 Suez crisis. Okay. Um, and, and on it goes. But Bartholdi was pitched into a depression. He didn't know what to do with himself because he had this statue that he was planning on. So he went on a little tour to sort of get himself out of the impression. He went to the United States. He went into New York Harbor. He was passing Bedloe's Island. And he said, hey, there's a place. And uh, <laughs> got some American investors interested in the idea. He got some uh, French investors interested in the idea. And uh, they said, OK, fine. We don't really like the Arab with the veil. And you find someone who looks American. So one Sunday, Bartholdi waited outside a Long Island church until he found an appropriately American looking woman and got her Stan. She's the woman you now see crossing the past Liberty Island. Um, and as a last bit of uh, information, Bartholdi needed somebody to build this thing, put it together. This colossus came in thousands of pieces from France. Uh, and he had met some interesting Americans in Egypt during his sojourn there. He met uh, four. Americans who were these Civil War veterans, who not only were teaching school, but they were also engineers. And those Civil War veterans built the Statue of Liberty. And I do.